morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's another lovely day in paradise. I've had a bit of rain overnight. A cold spell that's just uh, wearing off. We're in December. It's uh, sun's trying to peek through the very high overhead cloud, Cirrus. And uh, is it? I don't know. Might be Strata Cumulus. Who knows? When you were young, did they just try and did they try and tell you there was only about five types of clouds? And then <clears throat> when you get an, a pilot's license, you realise that they're trying to tell you that there are about thirty-five types. And then you come to the realisation that there, you know, there's just no, you can't categorise clouds. It's like trying to categorise fingerprints. They have sort of certain basic characteristics, but basically they have every shape and size that you know you can imagine. So I didn't have to defrost the car this morning, but I've had to. Do you know when you have to sort of dry it out a bit? So that's the blow. I might turn that down slightly. It's complicated by the fact that uh, I've got a leak in the radiator, so that every time I put the hot air on it, uh, it uh, I get a blast of uh, antifreeze in the face. In fact, in fact, that has actually stopped. Now I come to think of it, that has actually stopped. Now, pop quiz. Is that a good sign or a bad sign? It's a bad sign, isn't it, boys and girls? Because that means I've probably got no water in the radiator. So, that's why I'm not getting a blast of antifreeze, because there's no water for the antifreeze to be in. So I'm gonna to have to check the water levels my trusty Peugeot partner van that goes like a rocket but it's not going to be going like a go <laughs> it'll be going like a rocket with no propellant soon <laughs> if the radiator's uh, done oh dear me oh, I had a nice experience over the weekend I went to get my hair cut and I was meeting someone and I uh, they were late so I parked up in the high street just to wait for them to come out and meet me. I parked outside a barber's and I thought, uh, well they don't like being called barbers do they? they don't, have you noticed they like, they want to be called hairdressers? Now, if I cut men's hair, I'd want to be called a barber. I would not want to be called a hairdresser. However, for some reason, that's not the way they think. They want, they want, to be, they want it to be known that they are not just a, you know, a barber who just does men's hair. Oh no, they dress hair, they dress it. They're hairdressers, and I presume that sort of then makes it look like they've a wider market for cutting women's hair as well as men. I don't know. I don't know. Most men I know who cut men's hair don't ever do women's hair. Why they just can't be called barbers? I don't. Know. Anyway, anyway, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, a man. As it happened, it was a young woman. And uh, well, I say young. I mean, you know, she wasn't young, young. But I mean, at my age, all women are young. And. Uh, uh, we were having a chat, you know, about wherever, and she was telling me that she's uh, come over from uh, uh, Hungary and she lives with her brother, and blah blah blah, and everything. And uh, and uh, she seemed a bit down. So when she charged me for the uh, seven pounds, I think it was for the haircut, which I think was very reasonable, um, I gave her a twenty quid note and told her to keep the change. And uh, it's fantastic. If you can tip people, you know, if you tip people, I um, mean, not just sort of 10 pence or 30 pence or leave, leave 50p on the table for them at the table, table restaurant or whatever, but tip them properly, you know, tip them to their face, give them, and give them a, like a, an unexpectedly large tip, then. Um, uh, the, just the look on their face is classic. It's worth the 10 quid or whatever it was that I paid. Honestly, it really is. It just cheers you up. I, I shall be thinking about the look on her face for the next two or three weeks. Uh, because uh, the, it's the unexpected, you know, the shock, the surprise, the, uh, <clears throat> the sort of the, the variation on the theme of uh, getting the tip is obviously a well-worn theme as far as people who work in the service sector, apart from dentists. We don't get tips, do we? Mind you, somebody did bring in some wine the other day. So I dare say the Inland Revenue will say that needs to be declared as income. I think they bought in four, four bottles of wine or something, one for each member of the staff, which I thought was nice. 
doesn't often happen. Someone will bring in a box of chocolates or a panettone or something. Uh, but uh, yeah. So it's like you give her a 20 pound and immediately she's thinking, right, I've got to get a 13 pound change out of this. And then, uh, and then you just say, right, you know, be happy, walk out the door. But um, you have to, um, you have to make sure that they know it's a tip, you know. Because uh, the other day I was in Pizza Hut, and uh, I think my meal came to about twenty-three quid or something, and I gave her um, more than that. Let's put it that way. And uh, <coughs> and uh, and uh, I sort of I gave it to her, and I said, you know, thanks very much, and um, and sort of walked out the door and. Then afterwards, I thought I don't. She didn't, you know. I don't know whether she knows that she's supposed to keep the rest. She may just think that I've um, made a mistake and just and given her like ten quid more than more than I should have done. So I went back and I said to her, you know, um, I just wanted to check that you know that that's not, you know, <clears throat> that you're not supposed to put that in the till. That's that was your tip. And she said, oh, she said because uh, I, she said I did th think. That you'd uh, mistakenly give me too much, she said. So I did. I left it by the side of the till, in case um, you came back. <laughs> and of course, when I did come back, she thought that that's why I'd actually come back to um, because I realised I'd uh, gave her too many notes. But that was a that was a that was a complete cock up because that turned into a really embarrassing episode at the end. Whereas uh, the so I'm learning to tip, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. I am learning to tip. And I am learning there's a way to do it and there's an amount to give like for example if you you order a coffee and it's two pound forty then do not pay with a fifty pound note and tell them to keep the change because that will they will think that is weird they'll they'll just that is too much for them to you know what I mean it's a bit like someone coming into the surgery and having a filling and paint and saying uh, 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 hundred thousand. Here's hundred thousand pounds. Keep the change, and you're like, that. That is just not. There's something not right about that, you know. So, but, but, you know, just something that's a bit out of the ordinary cheers someone's day up, doesn't it? You know, what's the? You know, people are getting thirty pence tips, fifty pence tips all day, and what is what is thirty pence or fifty pence anyway these days? You know, the government's printed so much money. It's not really worth much anymore. Although uh, it always lags behind, you know, people don't realise that the money is. Uh, well, they see, I suppose, price inflation and the increase in the cost of their houses is the two ways that most people realise that the purchasing power of money is constantly going down. Um, although they tend to think of it as uh, as the price is going up rather than the purchasing power of their the money that they have going down but it's in fact that's what it is so I'm on a one-man mission to cheer up everybody who works in a menial service sector job at the moment let's see uh, let's see how, uh, how it works out and there's no point doing it you know expecting sort of a special service because um, I mean I dare say if I went back to that barbers which I've only been to once if I went back, they, they, she would recognise me, and or whoever was in the bar would say, "Look, there's that bloke who gave you 20 quid. Uh, he's coming back again, you know." But and then, then what do you do? I mean, what do I next time? What do I pay seven, ten, or twenty again? You know. I suppose ten would be enough because they wouldn't, they don't expect me to pay twenty every time. And then becomes a de facto price, doesn't it? Which I don't think that's what they would. Than ten. That's don't think that's what they'd want. They're quite happy with that as a, just a surprise, you know. Anyway, she seemed a bit down, and she was going on about, about you know, people go on about things and, and how they don't matter and, and how it's um, it's not a problem. Um, but then they just dwell on it a bit too long, you know, because it does matter and it is a problem. <laughs> so she's like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still living with my brother. I've lived with my brother for ten years, and then we moved to this country, and now. I'm, living my brother again and not that that's a problem you know that it doesn't matter <laughs> and you think oh you know you're really you're really getting fed up aren't you living with your brother <laughs> oh dear anyway so I cheered her up 
So that's it. What you can do, be happy. One day at a time. So, what else is going on? Oh, I've quoted a few people for implants. So we'll have to wait and see if that, you know, sorts itself out. And then I've got, as I say, I bought an implant practice. So I've got, I've got all these implant problems to deal with. And uh, one of them is I've got to restore some implants. The thing about when you go on an implant course and you start to, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're sort of you're expected to know about implants, right, from that point forward. And that doesn't just mean, you know, your, your implant, your first implant, you have to look after that, and then after a while you've got five implants and you have to look after those. Oh no, oh no. If someone comes in now and they've got implants, right, even if they're placed by someone else, then I'm expected to take over the aftercare of those implants in the same way as I'm expected to take over the aftercare of the, any fillings that have been done or crowns or bridges that have been done by another dentist. So, and, uh, oh, there's a massive protocol for, you know, looking after implants. You have to uh, include a report on, uh, you know, bone density, bone level, any pus coming up. Because the thing about implants that I've found out is that I don't, I, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, right? I mean, I'm not, I don't have OCD, but, I do try and do everything to an extremely high standard. And anything I do is one and done. It's, I, my crowns do not fall out, I'd like to say. My bridges do not fall off. Every crown that's ever fallen out, or bridge that's ever fallen off, that I've had to deal with, was done by someone else. So, and you could say, well, uh, you're Derek, you're over-engineering everything. And that's not true. I am just engineering it according to the books, because the books, think the same as me they think that once <clears throat> if you do a bridge properly you stick it on it should not fall off after a few years or to go decay around the edges or the gum shouldn't shrink etc <clears throat> so implants though that you know I implants are done in people who have got missing teeth and the teeth are usually missing because their decay was out of control or they had uncontrolled and still have uncontrolled periodontal disease so, this is my biggest problem and why I don't think I'll be placing a very large number of implants. And that's because, um, you know, I, I do follow this philosophy that you have to have a healthy mouth before you can have anything at all sophisticated done. And that includes crowns and bridges and it certainly includes implants. Now, I have to say, I have seen implants done in mouths that were not healthy. I, I In fact, I'll stretch that so far as to say I have seen implants done in mouths where no real real uh, effort was uh, put into trying to achieve periodontal health and now you may uh, say why were implants done and those patients angry and I would say to you that's a bloody good question isn't it and you know let's all let's all search our hearts and I think we'll probably find the answer won't we boys and girls but uh, I shan't be doing that. My patients will be healthy. They have to be healthy before they have a crown or a bridge. Uh, they have to, if they come to me with a bridge that's failed, and I said, tell them I can replace it, then I, I sometimes they have to wear a denture until such time as their mouth's healthy before I'll replace the bridge. Um, I've been known to make people wear acrylic dentures until their mouths are healthy before I make chrome dentures for them. And that's why I, I, I don't get much repeat work. <laughs> I'm constantly having to take on new patients because if anything goes wrong on one of my old patients, we have an inquest. What do we have? We have an inquest angry. An angry inquest. So, so obviously I'm seeing a lot of uh, implants coming in that are less than satisfactory. And on patients who, and that's the trouble because you've lost the argument by that point. You know what I mean? If someone says, if an implantologist is prepared to put an implant in, uh, for reasons that we won't mention, uh, in a patient who's, who has got poor periodontal health, then the, the chance to say to that patient, it's a condition of placing this implant that you improve your periodontal health, right, is gone. It's gone and it will never come back. Because the second dentist who places an implant then will be in conflict with the first implantologist, won't they? 
because the patient will say, I don't know why you're making such a fuss about my brushing. The first dentist put the implant in without any trouble at all. You know, perhaps I'll go back to him. Whereas if the first dentist had said, I'm not gonna do this implant until you improve your periodontal health, then some people who had never ever had a healthy periodontium might, might have been persuaded to finally accept the burden of looking after their own mouth and their own teeth and with, with, a, with a, a much greater uh, positive oral health outcome, you know, for the, in the future. So, so you get you get these patients who are, um, you know, have always had poor periodontal health, who are still still uh, you know don't accept that it's their job, or they don't accept that they're doing anything wrong. They really think that what they're doing is okay, and uh, they don't accept that. Uh, I'm just going to think of getting a quick way of getting around this bus. There's um, ingenuity for you. Couldn't get around the bus because of traffic coming the other way, so I've nipped around the left-hand side, up in and out of someone's drive. <laughs> Think laterally. Literally, laterally. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so there you are. You've seen that patient's been ruined, haven't they? They've been ruined for future implantologists because they've just been told, yeah, don't worry, we'll screw a tooth back in for you. And then not only does that, has that sort of queered the pitch for any future implants, but they've actually, in the process of losing the implant they've got. And one of the tests for a failed implant is to put your finger at the, on the, at the apex, at the root tip, buckily, and then, and then sort of squeeze down towards the uh, gingival margin and see if a load of pus comes out. And I'm like, uh... <laughs> oh, oh dear me I don't know if this implantology thing's for me if I'm going to have a load of bus filled patients coming in I just you know I'm like, I've seen implants that are, are pussing a bit of pussy around the margin but my the trouble with implants is you can't take them out you can't you have to put a trefine thing, like a tube, screw a tube, sharp tube up the side, and then until the, and then when you think you're at the apex, then twist them, and then they come out with the bone. It's not like a tooth. We're spoiled with teeth. With teeth, you can. I mean, I know you sometimes have to remove bone to get a to get a, a root out or something, but but you can't. Uh, I mean, an implant's a serious business taking an implant out. They really, they really, these old implantologists, they prefer to let it pass its way out. That's how they want them to come out. They would like, they would rather a patient say, this implant's getting loose, and what they do is they say, come in and see me next week, and then the next week, the patient comes in and says, yeah, yeah, here it is, here it is. Oh, that's good, that's solved the problem, isn't it? That doesn't solve the problem of the fact I lost all the bone, because of the infections destroyed all the bone. So they can't, they can't put another implant back in there. Oh my God. So, I'm not, I don't want any pussy implants. So I'm not gonna have any pussy patients. <laughs> fussy, a fussy dentist doesn't have pussy patients. That's my motto with implants. <laughs> ah, see. You see how you can be an expert on something that you know very little about and where you've only placed one implant, even though that was 100% successful. As far as I know, after three weeks. Right, so, are you gonna get, I mean, do you think, are you gonna get much for Christmas? Do your patients give you stuff? Do they, I mean, I mean, it's nice, you know, I think it's nice. I suppose some people uh, do uh, like, uh, carry on with, they sort of give, give gifts away, and do you think these people sort of give a, something to their doctors and something to their dentists and something to the newspaper boy and everybody. Do you think they give bottles of wine away to everybody? Or just to... It doesn't... It's not people who've had treatment in March or people who've had treatment in, in the summer. It tends to be people who've 
had uh, treatment like in the last month or so and um, I think they've just used uh, Christmas as a, a sort of a way if you like of a traditional gift giving season to say thank you. I mean I wouldn't mind if someone in January or February who, who had had a nice uh, uh, dent or crown or bridge or something did dro drop a bottle of wine in. Can't You don't really offend anyone by dropping a bottle of wine in I suppose unless they're of a religious persuasion that doesn't drink wine but uh, anyway but then on the other hand if, if nobody does it then that's fine as well I honestly don't do it for the money and I literally don't do it for the money either because I don't make any money I don't I don't make any money I don't I'm the worst dentist at making money ever I, I literally work for nothing if that's a correct word, use of the word literally, I financially work for nothing, so, or next to nothing anyway. I just love it. I just love the job, but not so much that I'm not gonna retire in a few years. Right, here we are, the Marlow Innovation Center. Within the grounds of the Royal Harbour Academy, one of the worst schools in the country where they put in a remedial teacher a rem they put in a remedial headmaster who they then had to remove after he slept with one of the pupils ha I think I think alleged allegedly the place that is has got security fencing all the way around it and looks like Ford open prison and in the middle of it is a bright orange building and in the middle of that is my dental practice. And it reminds me of uh, Ashford Remand Centre or Felton Borstal. All of were both very close to where I grew up. And I used to spend uh, hours on the footbridge over the railway there talking to the, the boys who were locked up in the cells. Poor bastards. Okay. <clears throat> right. Oh, well, it's been nice having a chat. I'll uh, talk to you tomorrow. Bye.